When I was a little girl at the age of 12, I used to page through the encyclopedia and I'd always stop the whale and dolphin page and I would always look at dolphins and go, wow, here's a really evolved brain, but it's in the water, so it's not like us. I wonder what they're thinking. So I decided to focus my energies on marine biology and dolphin communication. But I really wanted to get out in the wild and find a place where I could see them underwater and correlate their sound and behavior. And I eventually found uh, the Bahamas. In 1985, I went out and saw this place where dolphins were semi-curious about people. The water was clear and warm and fairly conducive towards research. For the last 25 years, Denise Herzing has come to this remote patch of sea in the Bahamas to learn how dolphins communicate and behave in the wild. My goal with the Wild Dolphin Project was to be out here for at least 20 years, to track as many generations as I could, I was hoping for three generations, and to get enough complex information about what their society was like, what they were like with individuals, and how they communicated to really decipher their communication system in a rich contextual detail, much like an anthropologist would go in and try to decipher the culture. Early next year, she will pioneer a new system of two-way communication between dolphins and humans, where dolphins will seek to communicate and interact with us. If it works, the system could lead to new ways to communicate with other social species, and could take dolphin-human communications to new levels. So this is my floating laboratory at sea. In the evening, we sit here, review our videotape, we log our data, running narrative, so we have logs of what we shot, and we try to make sense out of what we saw during the day. Since she began the Wild Dolphin Project in 1985, Ms. Herzing and her team have recorded almost 2,600 encounters with dolphins here. This rich trove of visual and audio information is shedding new light on how dolphins communicate and behave in the wild. So this is an example right now of a mother and calf that are whistling back and forth to each other. This is uh, Violet and Verde, her son. This is her uh, son coming up over from the contact call. So that's a, actually a perfect example of the mother calling the calf to come over. The calf's been kind of rambunctious and getting in a little bit of a trouble. So she's just called him over and now he's <laughs> very <laughs> appropriately hanging out under her and behaving himself. This work is building on what we already know about dolphin communication, most of which comes from captive studies of dolphins. For example, we know that dolphins use three types of sounds to communicate. Whistles, which are like names, echolocating clicks or sonar, and burst pulses. Their burst pulse sounds are fairly unstudied because they're very difficult for us to categorize because of their graded nature and their sort of long durations. These sounds probably carry the most information, at least that's my sense of it, than any of their sounds and where they might be sort of hiding encoded information. Scientists have also learned that all three sounds dolphins make contain information in the ultrasonic range, far beyond what humans can hear. Ms. Herzing believes that the secret to dolphin communication may lie in these upper ranges. There's potential for a lot of information to be encoded in these upper frequency ranges. It could have all sorts of patterns in it that we haven't really been able to decipher. By spending hours pouring through her video and logging key moments of interaction, Ms. Herzing is building a massive database of wild dolphin behaviors and how they communicate. Some encounters are more fruitful than others. Here, Dr. Herzing plays keep away with a piece of sargassum seaweed. An interaction like this provides the kind of opening she needs to do her two-way communications work, creating an opportunity for wild dolphins to seek interaction with humans. That encounter is also a really good example of what I call a window of opportunity. Here we have an object they like to play with, and so it's a way to maybe further the communication between us two species.
Building a system for two-way communications between dolphins and humans has long been Ms. Herzing's dream. The idea is to create a crude vocabulary for objects and actions that wild dolphins would learn. The idea isn't new, but so far it hasn't worked. In 1997, we started some pilot work with a two-way interface. Uh, the technology was fairly rudimentary. It involved basically a keyboard with boxes that played a specific sound that we tagged with an object, such as a scarf in the water or a piece of seaweed. Back then, technology didn't allow her to interpret dolphin sounds in real time, and in 2000, she put the project on hold. Then, in 2004, disaster struck. A series of powerful hurricanes swept over the Bahamas and South Florida. Ms. Hersing lost 30% of her dolphin population. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I'm out here every summer with them. I know their personalities, I know their family lines, I know what they've been through in their own lives to a certain extent. And it's shocking to think that a natural population could be so affected by a hurricane. But over the years, new dolphins have come into the group, and females have given birth, so that the population is now almost back to where it was, numbering some 100 animals. And so now, Miss Herzing is resuming her effort to create a two-way system for communicating with dolphins. The system is designed basically to have two divers be able to talk to each other, request things from each other, two humans, to model the system for the dolphins. If the dolphins mimic an acoustic signal that represents an object, that we can actually give that particular object to that dolphin or that human to show they are empowered to request something from us. That empowerment is what has many scientists excited. The hope is that dolphins will actually ask humans to engage. Ms. Herzing's effort, currently in the prototype stage, will be tested out here in the water next year. But I think to make a start, and just to acknowledge that there are other intelligent species that you might want to bridge a gap with, I think is pretty important. It might be important for the preservation of the planet. It might be important for finding other life in space that we might not relate to with our little primate bodies. I think it's gonna be important and I've got time.